say it. There we go. Okay. Hi, this is TTT on February 7th. And this is Marina Lombardo and Alana Winnick. And I guess we're guests facilitating our conversation today on TTT while Paul is taking some much needed time and um, enjoying life. And um, we're very happy to be here to talk more about Educon and continue conversations from last week and talk about AI. So <laughs> I guess we should all introduce yeah. ourselves, right? <laughs> yeah. I'm that's trying what to think thinking. of Paul, when you watch this, I'm trying to think of like your, the way that you, the trajectory, the flow. So I think after this, we do some introductions, even though we all kind of know each other. Anybody like to get started? Oh, perfect. Christina, want to go for it? Sure. I'm Christina Cantrell. Um, I uh, in Philadelphia, the Philadelphia Writing Project, and I work for the National Writing Project and like to hang around here at TTT. Great. Rohan, want to go? Um, hi, uh, my name is Rohan and uh, um, I'm an eighth grade student um, and I, uh, I like using AI to help me with my writing. Hello, my name is Aditi. I'm also an eighth grade student. And uh, right now I've been using AI to help me with uh, preparations, with uh, helping me prepare for my uh, d debate tournaments and as part of the school debate team. Did you did you use it to try to get the counterpoints? Did you try that out since the last time? I was a little busy uh, and I didn't get a chance to try it out. But this tournament, the upcoming one that's happening in March, I want to try it out because oh. the tournament was this weekend. Oh, how'd you do? Uh, well. It was an interesting story. So uh, we're allowed to compete as teams of three or teams of, of team or teams of two. Now teams of two have a way worse chance. Uh, so I I created a team of three, right? Me and two other kids, and one uh, yeah, two other kids. And then one of them uh, realized that he had some regional band thing to do, and then he wasn't able to come. And they told me that like the night before the tournament. <laughs> so we ended up having to go as a two person team, and uh, we did not do so well. Oh. There's always next month though, right? Yeah. Hopefully next time we'll actually I'll actually go in with a three person team. And then I'll I'll see I'll be able to see how it goes compared to the other tournaments. Oh, I guess I didn't introduce myself. Um, my name's Alana Winnick. That's all my stuff on the table that we're looking at. Um, but it's partly related to we're here to really talk about Educon um and what we learned and what we took away and also what we presented. So I did present um, one on failure in, using AI. So it's, it's sort of related to my big messages of my year. So um, I published a book and have a podcast both called The Generative Age about artificial intelligence and the future of education. And then I'm also, um, I work with Marina and I am a director of technology in Westchester County. And I sit on the board of directors of NiceGate. Marina, I don't think, did you tell in your intro what your job is or you just said your name? No, I think I just said my name. So okay. I'll say, I'll say more now. So I work with Alana at Pecanico Hills. It's in Westchester County and New York. And um, I teach third grade and I have been, I guess for myself and then for my students trying to figure out the creativity side of how AI can support sparking ideas and um, unlocking different stories and um, maybe like different pathways to go through narratives. So that's where I am. And that's kind of what Alana and I shared a little bit about when we were together at Educon, just how we were introducing AI to younger students. So eight, seven and eight, some of them were seven actually seven and eight year olds in a really innovative way that wasn't just about, you know, um, formative writing, but also like I could, it was formative writing actually. Like, and I could, I learned a lot about my students as writers while they were dabbling with prompt generation and us taking the prompts and putting them into art generators. And we've kind of, it's kind of gone in a direction we didn't really think it, it would go. And now we're at the point where we are getting some written feedback. 
I think we should share it. I think we should share the yeah. presentation. But, but I feel like I should go quick on my other one, just like yeah, like a setting the stage. But then I want you to share the presentation because I feel like it's mm -hmm. really great. Um, let me just hold on. It's I did it last time. Can Rohan and Aditya understand what, or I guess Rohan and Aditya, I can ask you. Do you do you know what Educon is? Did you talk I about it last time? Uh, but uh, I assume it's some convention te that teachers go to. That's a good question, Christina. Um, I can't share my screen. It's so weird. Oh. I did it last week. It okay. is. It's It's actually a school. Oh, I got it now. Go ahead, talk, Christina. Well, I was just going to say, it's actually a school in Philadelphia that um, does a fundraiser for, it's a public school in Philadelphia, but they do Educon as kind of both a fundraiser, but then also professional development um, for teachers. But it's also, but it's run by students. So it's a high school where the students run this conference. So it's very much an interesting, you can have really interesting conversations like Marina was talking about between students and teachers, um, primarily high school students at this conference and we're often, and Educon is often focused on sort of, you know, new and interesting technologies and how, what are some different ways of using and why should you, and, you know, asking critical questions and all of that. But I think what's really interesting about it is the student involvement, so. Yeah, and what I think is different about it too, because that was my first time, was mm -hmm. that in a lot of other conferences it's someone standing at a board presenting at an audience it's just maybe they're a little bit engaged but they're usually not super engaged and what I really loved about this one was that it was a really a conversation and you get to facilitate a conversation and I think it's more engaging and more um you get a lot more out of it I think because mm -hmm. everyone has something to share right not just the presenter yeah, that's right. They, they say that it's not about presenting, it's about leading a conversation, right? Like yeah. That's how they encourage you to organize yourself, yeah. Yeah, and they're, the sessions were an hour and a half instead of one hour, and not, usually they're like an hour, so that was a little bit weird for me, and I was like, oh, how am I going to fill the hour and a half? But it's really easy when you, when you shift the presentation into a conversation and you give um, timelines, so I'll just quickly go through... Um, just a little bit of what I did, but I really want to focus on Marina's. But my first one was uh, Generative Agent AI Symposium. So I broke it up into like three big categories and I showed a little video clip and then I had people discuss, but I started out a little more negative and then I went positive because I want to end on a positive note, but I could share these with you. But this is a really great TED talk. It's called Why AI is Incredibly Smart and Shockingly Stupid. Um, it's it's really great. Um, I know you, I see you guys laughing. You, you'll probably like it. Um, I put this, both of these TED Talks I'm going to show you into my book because I found them really powerful. And so I had them discuss questions and like, you know, I don't, I, I really do want to focus on Marina's creativity one, but if we want to come back to these, we have time later, but it was really just um, how do we help students learn about critical thinking and the ability to like discern uh, factual information if they're using AI and it's like AI literacy instead of media lit or both. It's really media literacy. Then I just got, um, showed a video on bias in AI because that's a really big topic. And Marina and I are going to talk about that a little too in our image generation and just talking about what stereotypes are embedded into different AI. And then I talked, showed this Sal Khan TED talk called how AI could not, could save not destroy education and it's really about just transforming education and it's sort of like what we were talking about last week about um shifting from like the process to focus on the process not the product and more personalized learning so that like there's a, the theme and then the other one that i talked about was about failure so both marina and i were really lucky we were fortunate to do um like a ted style talk at the nice gate conference so i talked about that and most of my talk was talking about like what does success mean so this was supposed to be a failure but i really want to start with like what does success mean and like then what does failure mean and 
So I talked about my brother maybe not being super as successful as me in school, but in life, um, he's pretty successful. So um, just focusing on like, what, how do you define success and how can we help students? That's what this one is. How can we help students define their own success? Because success might be different for everyone. And we really need to make sure that we're helping our students grow and not just getting a good grade. Um, so this was about how to define success. And I was talking about how AI is new to all of us. We're all going to fail. Like everyone's going to fail when we use AI for the first time because it's new for everyone. And then I tried to make the image on the left with an AI image generator and it came out looking like it does on the right, which clearly was a big fail because that doesn't look um, the same. And then I showed this t th these video clips. But what I found really interesting, I'm not going to share the whole video, but I want to just, um, I'm not going to play it. I want to pull up this one part of the video. I never knew this. So there's this video. There's three different types of failure. I thought this was really fascinating. Basic failure, which is just like, you know, you didn't you didn't really think through it and you made like a silly mistake, let's call it. Complex failure. And they said like the supply chain during the, the pandemic, like maybe someone got sick or like there could be a whole variable of different things that were not foreseen. And then intelligent failure. And intelligent failure is really where like success comes from because it's those, um, those like, it's like a scientist discovering something for the first time. Like you wouldn't have ever thought that you maybe would have discovered it. So intelligent failure is really good. And we really need to create a culture that embraces this type of um, intelligent failure, especially in a world where it's like new to all of us. Um, and that's really what that one was about. Just talking about what students need to be successful. I have this passport to success. And I was really trying to, even though the title said failure, focusing on like redefining failure so that failure can lead to like success. So that's really all I really had to share for that. But I just wanted, you know, we could open it up and talk about anything, but I just wanted to just give you a little background. So what do you guys think? Did it spark any ideas? Um, I was thinking of the different kinds of failure and honestly, I think it kind of makes sense now. Like you make a silly mistake, like a simple mistake on your math test. Like, oh, I added instead of subtracted. That's like more of a simple failure. Yeah. And then like you said, someone like a scientist discovering a new thing that, that would be like an intelligent failure. Yeah. So I guess we should, and then I guess when they say failure can lead to success, I feel like now it makes a little more sense for like intelligent failure. Maybe it'll lead more potentially more to success than uh, you shifting around uh, a negative sign or like something like that. Um, right. But if you're so focused on like getting an A, let's say, and you're so focused on that and you're not going to like leave your comfort zone and try something new, then you might not have an intelligent failure because you really need to leave. Oh, I forgot my last slide. I, sorry. It's such a good slide. Um, it was in, oh, here we go. So here is my life lessons from this year for my, all my things I did. So two life lessons, your comfort zone and where the magic happens. So that's like what I was just saying to you was like, you need to leave your comfort zone and do something that you're not comfortable with that you might fail, right? You might fail, but something magical might come out of it. Like literally I published a book and start a podcast and that's really scary to put yourself in an uncomfortable situation like that but something really great can happen and the other lesson I got out of this year was you can do anything literally you can do anything you put your mind to but you can't do everything so what do you think that means I can tell you what I, what I meant by it but what do you guys think honestly that kind of just reminded me of something that uh we did a while back, um, we were reading this book in English class like last year, Rohan, you remember Freak the Mighty, right? Yeah. And mm -hmm. a whole thing of that book is that there's this one kid who has like severe disabilities and then uh, that's the whole thing. And before we read the book or after, we basically did this activity where we were at like, it was the future and it was like a design a child workshop. And you could like, you had like a certain amount of money to spend and then you could pick the stats, how good your child is at certain things. And like, if you tried to divide the amount of money you had evenly between all categories, like intelligence, health, 
And you just can have a child who's not good at anything. Whereas if you picked what you're good at and what you're not good at, uh, you ended up with a child who is better overall because they were focused in one area. Yeah, so what I, that's good. That was a good description. What I, per, my person, and everyone can interpret it differently. What I said was like, I was going through a lot last year. Like I was working full time. I was in school at night. I wrote a book. I started a podcast. I did this TEDx style talk. And I realized I could do anything I put my mind to, but at some point you're spread super thin and you can't do everything all at once because you don't have enough time in your day or energy or bandwidth. So my, the moral of the story is use AI to help you with the things that you can get help with. Because if you can get a first draft started with something and use AI to help you, then, then you could do more. You can accomplish more. You could be more efficient. So, but... But make sure you put your focus where you, where you want. But that that saying could be interpreted for everyone. So mm. Anyone can have any variation of thought. Anything else before Marina takes over? Go ahead for it, Marina. Okay. All right. So let me, I'll just pull this up. Um, Okay. So Alana and I led a conversation around the work that we've been doing with the my third graders, which has expanded to our you know more of our school. And so it's just kind of like the story of how it all happened. Oh, you know what? Some of these are hidden. Oh, if I do it like that. Okay, great. So I'll just kind of go through all the story with everybody and just interrupt if you want to just hear more or say more or, you know, say something. So one thing we did, we had a huge conversation with the students on what intelligent is, just what the word intelligence means before we broke it down into human and artificial intelligence. And what was so perfect because I think it was the morning that Alana was coming in to co-teach these this first lesson with my students. It might have been the day before, the, the morning before. We actually had a lesson with our guidance counselor on the brain. And it was the first lesson in this series of lessons about, you know, um, different SEL components. So emotions and learning and just the way we do things best. And the students used the word networks and were able to have conversations about how different parts of the brains, the brain works together to do different functions. And that actually paired really nice with this whole conversation about intelligence and the difference between human and artificial intelligence. So we really started a lot of the work around creativity with some really technical language, believe it or not. And we also used code.org to kind of give the students a broad overview of AI and what actually happened. Again, it's like everything, like the stars aligned with like this. So we were feeling like this is fate that we're going in this direction. We had a student who like knew that we were going to do this. So oh, yeah. I don't um, know how. Yeah. So Alana actually, she's our, um, our director of educational technology. And she comes into the classroom to introduce the students to new hardware. If there's a new platform, she helps educators to um, lead different types of experiences and integrate their content with technology. And the students saw that she was there. And just one kid, before we even showed anything or talked about intelligence, said, oh, you're here for AI. So we thought that we like looked at each other. We're like, that's kind of weird. I mean, it was September early. Yeah. And we didn't really know. Of all but, things. I was, what? Yeah. So apparently this particular child had spent quite a long time over the summer on code.org which if you are all familiar with, it's um, you know, a platform that you can access different yeah, coding programs. And they had watched this video on AI, how it works, and then played the game AI for Oceans. Wait, can I tell everyone what I did with other classes? Yeah. Okay. So I took this as a model. And with the other classes, I didn't necessarily do all the things you're going to see after this. 
But the way that I rolled AI out to our students was I taught them using the same activity, even like middle schoolers, I use the same thing. Because it's like, what is AI? We, we have a whole coding initiative too. So what's the difference between um, machine learning or AI and coding? Like coding is when you tell the computer exactly what to do. And AI is when you train it to make its own choices. Um, so then I we trained a model. So this activity that Marina is showing you, it you sort through what's fish and what's garbage in the ocean to try to save the fish. Um, from the garbage in the ocean. That's like your goal. But what I do with the other classes, I purposely didn't train it well. So they could see that if a model is not trained well, then it's not accurate. Like we maybe we killed some fish. Maybe there was still some garbage in there. So I wanted them to learn that the humans are training AI and the AI model is only as good as the humans that are training it. So I really wanted them to understand that. And then after that with the rest of the kids and then we're going to go on a different tangent with marina um i taught them like what is bias mean because even a first grader and the way i describe that to them is like okay so if you were an ai image generator and i told you to generate an image of a nurse what would the nurse look like what do you guys think the first word out of everyone's mouth was female yeah sure. she a she, woman sure, who, sure. like, they didn't even mean it. They're like, a woman who, a girl who she has. And I was like, why does it have to be a girl? And they're like, I don't know. It does it. And then I was like, what other biases are there in the world? And then they started thinking of their own biases. So I tried to help teach them, like, okay, if there's 100 pictures, pictures of a nurse, and 95 of them are a woman, but only five of them are a man. The AI is going to just think that a nurse is a woman. So I try to help them understand why there's bias in there. And now when they use AI, they're going to look for the bias and the misinformation. So the first time they ever were exposed to AI, that was how they were exposed to it. So now they're, we call, we call them detectives and they have to like look for all the bias and misinformation. So I think some children, not the two of you that are, you're not children, but you know, students that are not on this call, you see it for positive. Some students see it as like cheating or something like that. And I think now they see it as a tool, but they also need to be really critical of it. Um, and now Marina could take it in a more creative um, path. But but this project sparked all of that for the rest of the district. Mm -hmm. Oh, and there I am. <laughs> So another thing we should tell you is that originally when we started this work, it was finding the intersection between computational thinking, computer science, and creativity, and artificial intelligence. So we did a lot of work around like language that is important in, the, in that world and having some conversations about the cloud and making sure we're understanding that the cloud is not a literal cloud. Um, we also kind of wanted to break that idea that they thought AI was a robot just because of this game that we played. And they had read a book the year before called The Wild Robot. So they were really into robotics and, and all of that sort of stuff. So we just kind of wanted to build some clarification around that too for them. And here... Maybe I can make this just okay. So here's where we started to actually start doing some work around other other parts of language like input and output. And the way that it was explained to the students, maybe I should make this bigger or should I okay? Um my writing is the input. So I'm actually doing the writing. I'm the human being that's doing the writing and putting it into an AI generator. The AI is creating creating my output. So one way that we tried to illustrate this was just through a simple, like, just kind of a, a diagram that showed, here's where it starts, there's the arrow, that's what happens. And um, that actually was my purple seahorse that I created. So um, really trying to find different types of blending and, and ways to use computer science authentically. Here's something you guys will enjoy. We had some conversations around this in the classroom. So this was a real Twitter, was it Twitter, Instagram, um, some type of social media know. post that Alana yeah. found. And 
the kids so had funny. a good time with this. It's really gross, actually. <laughs> I know. <laughs> they they were laughing hysterically when we they they couldn't stop laughing at it. They thought it was mm -hmm. the funniest thing they've ever seen in their life. Yeah. It just but it just goes to show you, right? Like how specific you have to be sometimes. And especially, you know, when you're talking about creativity and like creativity, like maybe it feels like a little like free form and you just kind of go with it. Like, but if you're gonna use it in this tool, you might need to kind of have a lot of you might have to consider some stuff too. Just like multiple interpretations of the language you're using in the particular order that you put words in. So we discovered that and we had some, we, we, that led to really great conversations like with conferencing with students and you'll see some of it as we get a little further into it. Oh, this is so fun. You guys should try this. Yeah. It's so much fun. So this app, um, we I did, should I open it up? Maybe I should open it up just to, you guys can see. I don't know if you're sharing that screen because I'm sharing. not. So I think I can share here. Is it sharing now? Yeah. Okay. So we actually before again before we started writing, we actually showed them some prompts, um, some picture visual prompts in this game, and then they had to guess what the words were that matched the image, and that was kind of fun too. So. We kind of took a lot of steps to get there, but this was another one too that we used to get them thinking. And back over here. Questions. Okay. You know what? I should have showed the other one that had more of the story. Okay, so, but that's okay. So this is what we did. Oh, and I should tell all everyone here because Alana, they've all used now comment, right? You you guys use now um, comment with your teacher, right? Is that where yeah. you yep. Yeah. So I don't know if you've ever used the thinking partner that is text to image generating. There I think it's it's text. I think that's what Paul named it. Have you ever used that one? I haven't. Actually no I think we did one for the first day in, in youth voices we did. Remember? The generator for topics, Rohan? What? Oh, oh yeah, that's, that's probably a really good way to use it. Actually, I never thought of that. Um, I played around with it a lot last year. Paul and I were we were working with some people who were going into teaching, uh, specifically with a STEM focus. So we did a lot of work around, you know, implementing AI and how could it help you as an educator. So we used now common and thinking partners. But what I did for for my own fun was I actually used the, that to help me generate images, to help me write my own poems. And I actually have a journal on now comment that just, I think for a couple of weeks, I was just kind of doing like a really like iterative process where I would write a poem and then ask for an image. And what it does is it actually creates, it actually creates more of a prompt for you. And then you take the prompt and Paul suggests, I think he suggests stable diffusion. I don't know if that's still the one that it's connected with because it's been since the summer that I used it. And then I would take, a, I would get another image. I'd pick one that I really liked and then I would use that image and I would kind of like now write a new poem. So it was like each poem, each poem led to an, another AI generated image. And then each generated image that came from the previous poem led to a new poem. And then I would actually read all my poems and I would start looking for themes and threads that connected that um, had a message that I felt strongly about and kind of like wove different parts together to create a couple of new poems. So I was really like, I was really into this as a person. And then I I think when we were talking over the summer, Alana and I, I was kind of like, yeah, this, I, I can definitely see the creative impacts that this has. So what we had the kids do is we had them create a prompt after we did some of these early activities. And I really encouraged them to use an animal because I felt like that would be a great way. Some of them did different things. You'll see a couple of them. But they wrote out their prompts and I got a little, a lot of really good information about their, them as writers from this. And they had a lot of fun creating 
they also learn to be a little bit ref, a little bit more reflective about their writing and maybe some of the choices that they were making and um they were revising so let me just get, get to some of that other stuff could hop around a little bit i think we did that the other day too um So here they are, hard at work. Okay, so here's what and I did to support them because they we actually didn't know that they could use Padlet yet. We didn't know that that was available to them. So we used Dolly, but Dolly, but we used it like outside of school. So they, they put in the prompt, as you can see, prompt one, and we have a real 3D dog in the middle of a field running with a soccer ball toward a goal on a turf field with a lot of trees. So we would take the prompt, we we would put it into Dali, we would get the strip of the four images put it on this shared powerpoint because we, we also wanted everybody to see one another's too so that they could again look for patterns because again pattern recognition is a part of computational thinking and computer science so we wanted to kind of also build that too like what kind of patterns are getting people closer to the results that they're looking for and this was our first so this was this first this student's first attempt anything that ne anyone's noticing that they want to point out I think you can see all these right you don't need to raise your hand you could just you guys could just yeah talk. I noticed over here from the first image uh first off this soccer ball looks a little blocky and then second off this tree kind of seems to blend into the corner of the gold post mm -hmm. um and then there's some, something else I noticed for, for a lot of these I think if uh, towards a goal on the turf with a lot of trees, I think that that just made some of the trees kind of come onto the turf. Mm -hmm. so instead, if you would have said a lot of trees in the background, I think that might have created a better image. Yeah, so th there's some vague language, right? A lot of, what's a lot of trees? You know, what's a real dog? What's a 3D, you know, like what? So there was there was definitely some work for us to do around language. And I can show you here just some of those noticings that we share. And this was a whole nother lesson. And this is a lesson that I would have done with students during a writing workshop where they were writing a narrative or during an AI prompt generating lesson on mini unit on creativity. So we really talked about like being more specific, using colors, using the names of colors, using the sizes, using the names of shapes and using textures. And these were some of the not specific words that we saw on those first attempts. We saw the word cute a lot. And what's cute? Like, that's subjective, right? So what's cute to one person might not cute to another person. Um, real was another word that we came up with that we saw a lot. So we really, that's when we said we have to like kind of think about some mediums like photograph. Do you want to see something that's more of a photograph or are you looking for more of a cartoon? Um, I was some, thinking that real, yeah. real is interesting to me because mm -hmm. I was like, oh, there's like cartoony, dog. like what is a real dog, right? Mm -hmm. When you're in this kind of, image space is just it's just a very interesting word in an image yeah. space it is that yeah and it was one that we kept seeing so uh, and then yeah. you see a lot too yeah um so that that was something that came out of these here's another one yep this is one where we have student three's prompt one and prompt two so i'll show you prompt one Make a real cute kitten wearing ballet shoes in a ba background of pink roses. This one's, she's my favorite, this one. I feel like you like the other, the next one best with the. I do, that's my favorite. <laughs> this one's mine, but I think it's because I dealt with her like throughout it. So show the next one. Okay, so that was prompt one. And then there was a revision for prompt two. So you could see the image types really different, right? So it went from a little bit more photographic to like um, cartoony. 
this student honestly almost cried in class. She was so upset at how the picture came out. This was not what she was wanted. And you could see she's like in tears almost during her um, recording. So most of them only did maybe two prompts. We, they got an option to do three. Um, I immediately pulled her over and we talked about the word real. And did you give them, I can't remember if you, did you give them the alternatives for the word real yet? Did you, we went through that slide, right? No, I, I did share that. It's funny. Cause right. This isn't an order and yet I'm going back and yeah. forth. So, so we, so we yeah. kind of gave them some different types of images that they might want to think about using. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So illustration, photograph, like what what exactly did she want to so show her little reflection it's kind of cute she's so very sad this one. yeah oh. I still like my person it still looks here. Yeah. Please. I really like my first one. This one I hate. Bye. She's like, I hate it. Bye. Um, well, I think sometimes that, all, again, like as a, a someone who loves writing and loves to help people with their writing, I really also appreciated that. Now I'm seeing this. I mean, I've actually watched this video a bunch of times, but I'm thinking about it now too. And just sometimes the first time is the one that you're like, that's the one, you know, and you can take something through the process so many times. And if it's, it's changing so much, you know, it doesn't go back to like that original idea. But I think we have what we ended up doing for the last prompt. So here was the, the change that really helped um, her to get a little bit closer to what she was envisioning. And I have to share uh, w definitely one more. This is the best one. If you're not a fan of snakes, you may want to look away. <laughs> Disclaimer, sorry. I should have said it. I always like to say it after. So this is my student who loves snakes. I am pretty confident that this kid is going to be somebody who legitimately studies snakes and becomes, I don't, I don't know what the specifics name of the scientist is they of course wanted to create an image with a snake and a snake attacking a mouse but when you look at the first prompt a big black timber rattlesnake in striking position on a rock in the forest attacking a rat with a shirt that says food <laughs> so there's first of all it's like a it's a run-on right and it's got lots of prepositional phrases in it and there are lots of different orders and it's not really indicating what's the most important thing in the image. So it kind of came out like a mythological beast from like ancient Greece. So that's like, they're kind of like creepy looking. And all of the kids were like, <gasps> you know, um, when I sat and worked with this particular student a little bit more, we kind of, we kind of just framed that question. Like what's the most important image in this? Uh, what's the most important object or thing in this picture that you want to create? And let's focus on that. And the, the mouse is important, but it's that the snake is attacking the mouse. So I would say that through all of this work, I was learning learning so much about their writing too. And, and the work that I needed to do with them this year to also help them be clearer writers, not just to do an activity like this and begin to spark stories, but also to help them to be, to communicate effectively. If they've got all these great stories, um, I want people to love them just as much as they love them too. So, and, and, and getting them to understand that as well um, was an important like hook in all of this too. And so spelling makes a difference too. <laughs> they learned that. Yeah. Oops, we spelled two two incorrectly. And during this time, we also did a lot of accessibility feature work with because that's also using artificial intelligence too. So spell check, speech to text. 
And lots of reflecting. Oh, go to the that one. And then I have I ha, I have a picture of the our bulletin that I'll pull up after. Oh, okay. This is, yeah. Um a foreign language example. So they wrote a writing piece, but it's in French. And what I found fascinating was this AI image generator. This goes back to the bias. 100% of the images were white people, unless we specifically said otherwise, which I found to be incredibly biased. And then the students, because that does not reflect our population. So they went back and they really described much more specifically what the person should look like. And then we got closer to that. Um, and think also, it was related to the language? Sorry, just to clarify. Uh -huh. Do you think it was late? The bias was 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 maybe connected from to the language, or I think honestly, I think it might have been because it was in French. But a lot of times, like for example, um, when Marina did book covers, it was majority majority of the images were white. Like okay, so you're finding that in general, yeah. Okay, yeah, okay. yeah. Like right, Kent had to go back and specifically go back and say. Uh, what, did, what was the language he used? Did he say an, an Chinese or did he say Asian boy? I don't remember what he wrote. To get I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, did they actually write the prompts in like French or did they, or these English prompts? And then This one was in French. That's a good question. But yeah. we have done something like this. Uh, Marina, do you have a link to the Padlet with the book covers? Yeah. I have yeah. I have it. I could pull it up. So okay. Marina did... Um, book covers in Padlet and oh, not that one, uh, not the brilliant. I can find it. Um, we had book covers with uh, the students did, and it's, it was the same thing. And that one was in um, English. And unless like the student went back and specifically wrote what it was, right? Like Alana didn't want to go back and, and edit hers, right? No. She didn't. It, some of them didn't. Some of them didn't want to change it to look like them, and they left it like that. And some went back and they changed it to um, what it was. As if the default was white. Yeah, it was kind of. I didn't like it. Yeah, that's disturbing. I re oh here we go. I got it. Let me share. Yeah, it really bothered me. So I reached I reached out to the vendor because um that's just how I am. I'm like, I just want to make sure they know that this is happening. Okay, there's a I lost the Kumo spaces for a second. Okay, let me share my screen. Um, in this case, you were it was via Padlet or was it another? This one I'm showing you right now is Padlet. Um, the other yeah. one, I don't know which one our French teacher used. She might have used, I don't know. I don't want to quote anything. But so you see, yeah, this is, these are all white girls. She's not white. Yeah. Like that's not reflective of her. And I talked to the principal about it. Like if he, if he wanted us to go back and like, or not. I, I didn't know what to do, but we did have one boy who went back and, and look at that. It looks pretty close to him too. Mm -hmm. So he went back and edited it to make it look like him, but we were finding, you can see most of the people that they put are white yeah. unless they, they specify. And then I'm going to stop sharing so I could share this other screen. Um, this is another um, unit that Marina just did, and I'll let her talk to it because it's a really fun one. I love this one. Marina, want to tell them about this? Yeah, so this this is a bulletin board that our fantastic art teacher put up, and we did a collaboration between the art classroom, the library, and the academic classroom, and we read the book Blue, which is about the, col the history of the color blue, and our art teacher had the students learn like the different ways to draw gemstones um, to, you know, so they have that like 3D effect and all the different ways that they're cut and then the different shades. And then in my classroom, my students 
research their birthstone. Um, the and they they learned a lot about their their own birthstones, and we wanted to really tie it to the work to identity. So then they created the birthstones with the art teacher as well, and the students began to write some poems. So they pretty much like did like what I did in the summer, and they started by writing a poem based on what they learned, the factual information about their particular gemstone, a birthstone. And then they, we, I took their poems and I put them into co-pilot and I just prompted and I said, I am eight years old and I just wrote this poem about my birthstone. Can you please generate a, an image to match my poem? And then I took those images that they got. So there's a four of them. And I put them onto their document with their poem and they just loved having four different choices to pick from. So they um, picked one of them and then they had to use that image to now create another line or two to add into their poem. So they were using the picture that came from the original poem, just like I did, to get some more writing. And then they, then we put it in again if they wanted a different picture. And ultimately they had like maybe like, you know, four to eight pictures to select. And we had their poems next to their poems. Their written poems are next to the artificial intelligence generative art that they selected that matched their poem. And then it's also next to their hand created art too. So it really like showed the, a little bit of both, right? So what the, the work they did with their hands and the works, the work that came from their minds and putting it and prompting an AI to see like what, it, what, what connects with this poem? What do you generate when you read my poem? I yeah. love this project. Yeah. And right now, actually, we're doing um, this is just, just like a little like kind of like fun thing that we're doing is we're we have a door decorating contest in our school and we're doing a Minecraft themed door. Uh, my students love Minecraft and I love Minecraft. So what they did is they wrote up a description of them, a physical description of themselves. We actually had started this a couple months ago with Legos. So they made like special edition Legos and now they've got their own personal Minecraft. And I, again, the same idea. I gave them the four choices and I was very like, you know, clear with them. I'm like, if you don't like what comes out or if you do not feel that that is representative of you, we're going to work on it because I, I don't want them to put anything up that they don't feel connects with them or matches who they are. Um, so, you know, in, in connecting back to what Alana was saying, we've also had a lot of like really important questions about, um, you know, the images that are coming out and, you know, and, and selecting the one, that, you know, we feel best represent us and having conversations when they don't like what, yeah. what might be going on here. Yeah. I mean, I reached out to Padlet and I told them what was happening. So I was speaking to the head of um, the image generation. AI image generation. And it's not their AI. It's another AI that they're using. So it's not like they built it or trained it. Um, but I definitely think it's important for companies to know when you find these things that they're happening because they're, that's how they're being built right now. And, and they really need us to tell them. Uh, what company would this be, by the way? Like Padlet? Well, that's just one example. We use many. So so that's just one example, but I definitely told Padlet that it was happening. I think that's one problem with AI that needs to be fixed. Yeah. How do you think we could fix it, though? At least reduce it. What do you think we like, could do to fix it? What? What do you think I mean, we could do to fix it? Like, I mean, bias in general is a hard problem to completely eliminate, but I think we need to try our best to at least mitigate all most biases, especially like racially harming biases like yeah. this kind of bias also yeah. um i forgot to say uh, rohan um so me and rohan are part of the school's engineering club and uh we aren't able to go to the we usually have like an in-person competition in like april but we aren't able to go this year 
So instead we're doing projects that we're going to submit to the competition that are going to be displayed. And then we're going to be, um, and then they're going to be judged and it's like a competition. And so we're doing multiple projects together uh, as a group with a few other friends. So one of the projects we're doing together is we're doing, they just opened up this cool competition called vlogging, where basically you create like a series of videos uh, on a specific topic and best video series wins. And the topic they decided on for the first year is uh, ethical uses of AI. Mm -hmm. So uh, me and Rohan are starting to work on that in the- Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Hopefully That's we move this list. <laughs> you have That's to share so it with cool. where you can. I yeah, that's, those are the conversations that really need to be happening. With the, yeah. With their, so. uh, the funniest part is we're also going to end up competing against Rohan's uh, sister because she's also she's like a year grade below us. So we're competing against her and her friend too. So, Wait, are you guys in the same grade? Uh, yeah. yeah, you know we're we're like in a lot of classes together. We have like gym class and like lunch and stuff together. The last, were there any other classes aside from gym? I don't think so. But last year, did we have anything? I think we did. Maybe. I don't remember. Those are very important topics. They're, and I feel like a lot of students are not thinking about that or talking about that. It's very, yeah. very good of you to make that your Maybe you can about. share with us here at TTT. Yeah. yeah. We, can... we would love that. We will once the uh, once we finish the project uh, and stuff. We're also doing some other ones. Bro, can you please stop taking the keyboard. <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, we're doing some other ones. We're making a we're doing a project where you have to kind of create a board game that you can play in the car, like a game you can play in the car. So we we'll, like have to create like a few we have to create a few prototypes of that and then submit them. Uh, we're also doing a project where we create a website for a fictional maker space like in our community. And then I'm doing a project with someone else. It's like a, a design challenge that we get, and we have like a week to finish, finish it. And we got that design challenge in March. And so we're gonna submit all four, pro, four or five projects, and hopefully maybe we end up winning some awards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds great. Yeah. Right I love that. And actually, I just want to say, were you just gonna say something about my? <laughs> I actually ended up, so I know Alana mentioned that, you know, she gave a pretty big, big speech in November, but I actually kind of went through the process. I kind of, I did. I went through the Ooh. process the year before and what the two of you were just sharing about and the, the competitions that you were getting ready to go into and participate. I wrote my story about a time when I was younger and I was so incredibly excited to have an opportunity like that. Um, it was for a, like a science fair, but this, the story I end up telling, it has so many different themes in it, but one of it, the main, the main idea is that I completely misunderstood what type of contest it was and what I created, which I loved was not what was expected, but I did have this teacher who when I guess going through the other participants in my classes work, you know, she said, Oh, you're the one that's going to go to the next round. And it was when I went to the next round and walked in that I was like, Oh my gosh, like this is not what they were looking for. But I learned a lot of really good lessons looking back on that. I didn't learn those lessons when I was younger. So, you know, these, these moments that you guys have, like there's so many things that like are happening that are so exciting um, especially like the design work. I love that that's so available to students now and, and to be able to share it and put it out into the world. So have fun with it and enjoy it. And think about like those little bits of what Alana was sharing too with the the failure. Some yeah, It's okay. You know, guys do a lot of really good, good work with yeah. different, I mean, debate, right? Debate, engineering. Yep. Yeah. So uh, I just, actually, I have, I, have to, the same I have to go. I just want to say I, it was nice to meet you, Alana, and mm -hmm. it was great to see the work that you all shared. And um, hope to see you next week, Rohan and Adita too. So, yeah. Good night. Thanks, Christina. Good night.
Yeah. So I have a story where basically the exact thing happened last year. I went to the competition, and basically the challenge I enrolled in last year was build a glider, like a a, a, wood, a wood like balsa wood glider, and then fly it. Um, and what ended up happening is that we did a similar challenge earlier in the year as practice, and our goal then was to get as far across the gym as possible. And then I didn't realize that the design brief was different when I was doing it for the state competition. And it turns out that their goal was to be spend the longest time in flight instead of going the farthest. So I ended up creating something that went super fast, super far, but it took, but I had spent so little time in flight um, that I, I did, I lost miserably. <laughs> But it was fun. It was a fun experience. It was fun. So there you go. It was fun. And you did something you learned, you did, you figured out how to do something pretty cool. And maybe it didn't like fall in alignment with like the directions of the competition or and everything, but Not to mention, I got to you're spend still, it. you're still laughing and smiling about it. So yeah, it's That's a good actually, I got to spend a day uh, with my friends just chilling on a college campus because they hold it in like the state, state college, uh, TCNJ. So uh, it was just nice. We were just chilling, checking out some of the other kids' projects. So it was fun. Great. Well, I know it's nine o'clock and that's kind of the cut time for TTT. So thank you, everybody. Um, and I think definitely, I know Paul would agree. We definitely want to hear more from the both of you with the work that you're doing, whether it's debate, engineering, or these really cool design thinking challenges. Some we love hearing about all of it. So please, you know, keep sharing. We're, we're all learning a lot from you, too. Bye. 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 See you tomorrow, Rohan.